other technologies. Okay. This is Damian Macy, representing the Friends of the Marshall Public Library, and I'm visiting today with Priscilla White at her home on North Michigan, and we are delighted to be able to visit with her. And uh, with that, Priscilla, I don't think you were raised in Marshall, is that no. right? So you might just explain a little bit about your home, your family and all, and also what brought you to Marshall. Oh. So with that, Priscilla, you're on. I do tend to get a little long-winded, so you can do like they do on NPR and just all, all of a sudden <laughs> change the subject. <laughs> uh, I was born in Massachusetts. My father is a past, was a pastor, congregational church. He started out as a Methodist, but my mother converted him to be a Congregationalist, <laughs> which is now United Church of Christ. It is um, consolidated with or united with several other denominations. Um, and then uh, my, uh, we lived in several different places in Massachusetts, and then my father enlisted in the Army. He tried to get into the Navy, but his eyes weren't good enough. But he was a swimmer, he thought that would do it. So he came home and ate carrots for I don't know how many <laughs> days because they said that that would make your vision better, but it didn't work. So they took him in the Army as a chaplain. And he served in the Pacific and in New Guinea. He was in New Guinea and he came into the Philippines just after the liberation. So he was there for the cleanup and we have a lot of memoirs of his that tell about that um, when they were liberating the camps and things like that and then in the Philippines when they, they oh and then in New Guinea when they lived in huts that's Papua New Guinea now but it was just New Guinea all right so then uh, we moved to Michigan to live with my grandparents during the war in Holland, Michigan. My grandmother was, my grandfather was English. My grandmother was German, and she always referred to her neighbors as those damn Dutch. <laughs> so whenever anything went wrong, or the butcher didn't do right by her, or something, says, those damn Dutch. <laughs> Um, then when, after the war, we lived in, um, we came, oh, my father was studying for his Ph.D. at um, uh, CTS, Chicago Theological Seminary, the liberal branch, and we lived in several places, uh, and we lived in Indiana so he could commute. Then uh, we moved to Illinois, he was still commuting. Then he got a, a, a church and his degree, and um, we went to Western. I went to Western, no, I went to, Damien, this is <laughs> too long ago. Um, I went to a girls prep school called Francis Scheiber Academy, which is in Mount Carroll, Illinois and has since moved to Chicago on the campus of um, Kent Law School now, I think. And uh, it's still going. It's based on the humanities and reading great works, reading the great works. Um, when I went, it was just a prep school, and then the last year they took in men sort of like what St. Mary's is going through now. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't have a say-so about it. But that was fine, and it worked out fine. Um, then I went to Western and met Bill. I'm so used to referring to him as Mr. White because we talk, I always talk to the students and they always call him Mr. White. So if I, <laughs> if I slip and say Mr. White, it's only because of that. Um, and he was just out of the service. Um, he was a student there at the school. He was also. a student. Okay. He was just out of the Marine Corps. Um, he played. He was on the football team, and um, he was a freshman, and I was a senior. 
And then, um, I'm trying to think. Oh, well, my parents were in Rockford at that time, so I w went to live with my parents and teach in Rockford for a while. And um, then we got married and moved to Morris, Illinois, mm -hmm. where his parents lived, and he got a job in a furniture store. He didn't finish school then. Mm -hmm. Then my parents moved to West Terre Haute. Really? Wow. And in the meantime, he um, had got uh, tuberculosis from the, because of his problems in the service. And so he transferred to Indianapolis uh, Veterans, Routabush Veterans Hospital in Indianapolis. And then I lived with my parents again while Paul was born uh, until he was out. This is a long route to where, how we got to Marshall. So um, since we lived in West Terre Haute, many people <laughs> in West Terre Haute made sure that church was over by 11 o'clock so that they could come get to Tom's and beat the Marshall crowd. Do you remember that? Oh, I do remember. <laughs> and so we came to Marshall too because <laughs> other people in the congregation did. Nice little town. And um, I was, I, oh, I know, and I was working on my master's at the time at Indiana State, so that took a year. And then I decided, well, I might, they might have a job over here. And Bill was in the Veterans Hospital at the time. And so. I came over to talk to Charlie Bush. Oh, yeah. And you know Charlie, always progressive. Always wanted um, something. He was always looking in. At, he'd go to these meetings and he'd hear the other superintendents talk about mm -hmm. things, you know, and, and then he'd come and, and, and put those into place. Well, we didn't have a speech and drama department, so he thought we needed that. And Mr. Holler had just oh. retired. Mm -hmm. Margaret Thornsburg got uh, hired the same year I did, and uh, so did, um, it may have been, uh, I'm trying to think, there was one other person, and we laughed because Mr. Holler always said it took three people to replace him. <laughs> <laughs> so I did the plays, but I also had speech classes. And then, uh, actually, there was no place for me in the high school other than that, so they put me in the junior high, and I taught English in the junior high for a while. Okay. Long way away from music. So several of my students um, from those first classes um, are in their 60s now, and we, we laugh because I was young and innocent, and, and, and I was young. <laughs> and they were eighth graders. <laughs> do you take the Marshall paper? The I do. Okay, look in the last, I believe it's the last issue, the 50 year thing. Yeah, the students, yeah. Well, your name is in there. Yes, it is. I got that. Okay. And I was trying to figure out how many of the people were still around or still living. I just read that last night and I thought, well, how interesting because I'm going to be visiting with Priscilla tomorrow. Yes. Um, someone else called that to my attention. I did that, um, oh, well, wait a minute, now you interrupted my train. I'm sorry so. about that. Um, <laughs> so, oh, I know, so I taught, uh, I taught English and then did the speech, in junior high, did the speech, drama. We had a wonderful time. We had a lot of, uh, we went to contests and there are still plaques there were until they remodeled, I haven't checked, but we still had, uh, every year we went, we got the first place big old plaque, and, and uh, we did, it, it was it was a good time. We lived in Belva's old house down there on South Belvin and, Belvin and Earl's old house uh, across from the Tasty Freeze or Dairy Queen. Which one was it down there? This was, which was, this was Tasty Freeze. Oh, Dog and Suds. Dog and Suds. Dog and okay. Suds. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
and we we that big house there, we rented that house and lived there and had wonderful parties with the kids after plays and things. And we did have some overnights. Dr. Elias had to come and check up because one of his girls was Barbara. Or one of, so he'd, he'd come and he'd knock on the door and he'd say, just wanted to make sure there was someone here. <laughs> and then he'd turn around and laugh. <laughs> but he was checking up on his girls. I'm sure. were, mm -hmm. But we were young and it was fun, you know. Um, then we, uh, then Bill graduated. Oh, all during this time, Bill's going to school at Indiana State and finishing up his degree. And then Charlie Bush, he really was a great humanitarian, really. He, did, he, he didn't care about people. Um, hired Bill for um, social studies and other things. Um, so then uh, I retired and, and uh, had Connie. Is that all? I mean, is this more than you want to know? <laughs> Fine. It's kind of interesting to the, to the interaction of, of people. Sure. Then Bill Bill worked at Tom's. Well, I'll bring this in here, but maybe um, he he bartended at Tom's and um, worked with Bill Casumpus and Grandma Casumpus and mm -hmm. and um, um, I'm going to tell you who a couple other people that um, um, Dina Porter's mother and I can't remember her name, but right now. Um, and um, he, um, what was I saying? So that's where he ended, learned how to cook from. Um, oh, Tom? No, well, no, no, Bill. It would, would have been Bill, but it was uh, the guy that was the cook there, and I can't remember. And his name will come to me pretty soon. But um, anyway, uh, eventually, so then we had a big upset at the school, and um, it was Mr. Callis and uh, Mr. Callis's wife. Do you remember Mr. Callis? Mm -hmm. Let's see, Priscilla, I went to Martinsville okay. High School, so but Eleanor went to went Marshall. Here. Well, you should and ask her And my family about was here in Marshall, a lot of them, so I was pretty well familiar with You them. ask her about Mr. Callis. Well, they, they, <laughs> tried, to, they tried to fire him. But, and eventually they did. But his wife, who also taught here, caused such a huge fuss, you know, that the school board made this big deal that they would not hire a husband and wife who would work in the same building, which of course now would be illegal. I mean, you couldn't do that now. So when I was ready to come back to teach, um, there was no job for me here because I was, uh, I, there was a speech position came open, but they wouldn't hire me. So I went to Kansas, and I taught in Kansas for eight years, Kansas, Illinois. And I taught music there, which I should have been teaching all the time, but I never got around to it. Um, yeah, and then, you know, Charlie felt bad about that. When he was down in Florida, I really liked the man, you know, because you could talk to him, and he would, he would listen, and whether he agreed or not, he would say, "Well, you have to stand up for yourself. No right. one else will." Good point. But then he'd go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> but that's all right, <laughs> you know. At least he listened, yeah. and you, you felt that he heard you. I mean, he he kind of listened, and. I have a funny story to tell about Bill teaching communism, but then we'll save that maybe for the next for the next round. Then um, and then after Kansas, then we had a couple other superintendents, and then when I when there was a music opening here, then I got that job at the high school. At the high, uh, no grade school. Grade school. Grade school. Yeah. And then I was there forever until I retired about teach private lessons. I taught private lessons just to make a little pin money 
way back in this would have been in the 70s and Chrissy Bennett was one of my first students yeah. and uh, whoever else was in the paper I recognized some of the names most of the names I recognize, but I've lost track of a lot of them. Did you give the lessons <coughs> here in your home or yes. at school well, or church? We, or? And then we lived in that big old house. We rented another house at Belvis when Belva and Earl, uh, and boy, there's an interest. Those are interesting stories for Belva and Earl. We missed those, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, those are really good stories. Oh, I mean, they, um, anyway, I won't digress with Belvin Earl, but I could someday. <laughs> um, they came back and then they renovated the old house down there. And so then we moved into another house of theirs down here on uh, 7th Street, on the corner which has been torn down next to Judge Lewis's house. Yes. That okay. vacant lot there. Yeah. And we liked, that was a fun house too. And then, then Grandma White came to live with us. Um, so at one time we had a grandmother and uh, a dog and three cats and gerbils <laughs> and parakeets and, <laughs> and two kids <laughs> and two kids the whole schmear. Um, then later, when we we bought this house, then uh, my mother was with us for a while. What and year did you move here? Do you recall? My mother, I do not. No, I mean when. About what year you bought and moved this, oh, this house? Oh, moved into this house. Um, I, uh, it must have been in the 70s, somewhere oh, in the okay. 70s. Yeah. That's why I'm not going to leave because it's all paid for. <laughs> so, yes, you know, we paid, this is kind of, I think this is interesting. We paid $15,000 for this house. That's how well I have the, oh well, yeah, I got the abstract here. Um, and um, Bernice Rossman said that this was the only house on the lot here. And then I think maybe this one, why they did so close together, I don't know. But the, across the street was a big park. Yeah. The trees. Everything, but it was pretty well settled by the time we bought this house. And we bought this house from Valley McDaniel. Oh, I remember. I remember. Her husband was yeah. a judge. Mm -hmm. And which is kind of interesting because uh, Thompson, Mrs. Thompson, uh, Frida, lived next door, and her husband had also been a judge. Mm -hmm. um, Valley moved back to Martinsville. Right, so. She has a house in the country there, mm -hmm. but I don't think that house is still there. I don't think so either. It was down the lane where the Morals house burned. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you might have known the Morals, Coney oh. and John oh. and John. Um, and the mantelpiece. In this house, there was this huge mantel. Bernice told me this. Bernice kind of grew up in this house because it was owned by somebody that her aunt or somebody. The mantelpiece was very huge. Valley liked the mantelpiece, so she took it with her to Martinsville. So when we moved in here, all we had was brick, just a kind of a crappy looking brick surround. So I found an old oak one at. Uh, at somebody's sale, <laughs> and it's not quite right, but it does okay. <laughs> Better than bare brick. So once when we were down there for a meeting, with, with, with for a, a dump meeting, and there was another story, but I'll save that for Bill. Um, when I was down there, we were down there, so Coney and I walked down to look in, <laughs> look in the windows of her house to see if my mantelpiece was still there. <laughs> I was going to ask if I could have it back, but Valley was dead by that time, and I don't know what happened to my mantle. <laughs> so, I, whatever. So, what else do you need? <laughs> You've given quite a few of your interesting things in, in the past. Is there 
a particular world event or something that really you feel may have just impacted you and changed world your thinking? Event. Well, yes. Uh, it was when, at the end of the Second War, when they dropped the atomic bomb. That impacted all, but for some reason, um, and then of course later I visited uh, Hiroshima Museum, uh, which is very well done. But I think that's probably why we got involved in the um, um, nuclear waste dump that they wanted to put here. Because of that, I always wondered why that impacted me so much at the time, because we knew the dangers of nuclear waste and, and even low-level waste, which can retain uh, dangerous levels for a long time. And then once you start with low-level, you kind of think, well, we can put a little more on a little more. <laughs> so I think that was it. I, I don't know if other people were impacted as much. Um, we knew several Japanese people after the war um, when my father was in Chicago in, in school um, he would bring home people uh, for weekends and he brought home a Japanese gentleman who was a studying to he was a Christian studying to be a pastor and um, I, I don't know, just conversations with those people and, and what, you know, now we're finding that, I mean, it took so many years before people started writing about it and the mm -hmm. horrors and everything. So I think that's probably the big thing. It seemed like trying made. to find out maybe that they, well, they are human too. Yeah, that, that's, that's right. Have yeah. feelings. But you know, I read my father's memoirs, which we are sending to his, um, uh, to, uh, Evanston to the uh, Northwestern okay. um, and he refers to them as Japs and see yeah. th see how that hits us now Ooh. but then see he was in the Pacific and that's what that's how they and I think Harry was a pastor and everything <coughs> but <coughs> it, that was just the term that, that they used very common would, then yeah we would not use that now I'm interested in your international thoughts there because you have a daughter who is spending a, most of her life on the other side of the globe. Yes, so, yes. might just elaborate a little bit on uh, Connie's experiences. Uh, Connie always has been, uh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what, a nurturer or a uh, and an adventurer and. Um, she went on a youth trip to New York where they served in a soup kitchen and this was years before we had anything like that here and that really impacted her so she got the idea that she wanted to go into some kind of service some kind of uh, humanitarian service so then um, uh, the church offered a, uh, the Methodist Church offered what they called a mission intern program for two years, uh, three years, where you would serve two years in a foreign country and then you would come back and serve a year in Washington, D.C. as an advocate and the Methodist Church has a, it, the only privately owned building still on Capitol Hill. Ooh, Everybody wants to buy it. <laughs> And all the other, the other churches rent uh, offices in there, and then that's, that's the advocacy base, the, the lobby base. So um, she had a choice of where to go, and um, I guess I influenced her to go to Japan. <laughs> now that I stopped to think about mm -hmm. it, so she applied for Japan, spent two years there working with the YWCA. And uh, they, they, they were paid something, but it was a pittance. And that was a wonderful experience for her. And then she decided, uh, then, they, then the church had 
a uh, program where you could teach for two years um, in China under the Chinese Christian organization Amity, A-M-I-T-Y. Not, um, yes, and you would have heard of that maybe through your church because there's a, there's uh, all different denominations mm -hmm. and uh, are in that program because you're not supposed to proselytize and you can't go and, and on your own. You have to be invited. So it's she, really oriented towards education. Is how it, yeah, it, this yeah. is their teacher's program. That's the only program of Amity that uses foreigners. Then the other programs um, of Amity are social programs such as services for the blind and the, and the uh, uh, developmentally disabled and they just you know just like our social mm -hmm. services and it's it's through it's like it's through but it's through there is there are no denominations in in um, China but the Catholic Church is separate mm -hmm. and they let the, they get to function but they have to function with Chinese priests <clears throat> can't bring anybody else. And, and the same thing with the, with the Protestants. You can't proselytize and you can't... Uh, and if someone asks Connie about Christianity, she can't say anything about it, but she can take them to her church. Oh, I she has a, oh, wasn't sure how that... Yeah. And out. <laughs> she has a, a, a woman pastor now because uh, there was a, a woman in a her husband, husband died. Um, very large church. Almost every city has one or two Christian churches. Mm. Okay. And Catholic mm. churches also. There's a Catholic church in her town also. Anyway, she did the, uh, she went for two years or three years, whichever it was, I think it was three years, over there to teach English to college students who were going to teach English. And then she decided that she wanted to get her um, degree. By the time she didn't have a degree in English as a second language yet, she'd had her English degree. But so she went back and got her master's. And so she took a year, year or two. And she went back to Amity, and she's been there over 20 years now, oh, off and on. Good. So that's her home. She likes it. And um, she's doing, feels that she's doing. She has a lot. Of she has a lot of the younger boys who come to her for counseling. Not the girls so much, but the boys, the ones that are having problems with their roommates and getting beat up on and all that kind of stuff, you know, and getting harassed and roommates are eating their, his food and <laughs> things like that. But she does a lot of counseling. So I noticed you have a lovely pet, and I assume you probably had a pet or a dog or a cat probably most of your life. Yes. And I see Connie, I know, has been a pet lover. This one came from China. I was going to say there's some history behind the dog uh, that you have, isn't there? She, uh, she found this on the street, flea-bitten and, oh. and uh, in bad shape and nurtured him. But she already had a dog and one dog was enough. She wasn't even supposed to have one. <laughs> so she brought him home. There's an um, organization called Globy Pet. Hmm. And and they come and they will come to your house and take your dog, dog, and they'll see it all the way through or cat see it all the way through quarantine, and then when you're ready to fly wherever you're going, they deliver it to you. Wow! And then they see it into the you you check and make sure it's yours. <laughs> and then what's they, the name of that organization? Globy Pet G L O B I P E T. Hmm. And and then. Um, well, it's not cheap, but <laughs> but it saves you a lot of hassle because you know yeah they have to go through quarantine, and I don't quite get this, but you have to go, had to go through quarantine over there mm -hmm. for two weeks, and then here. when it came over here, there was no problem. Oh, and she kept it under her seat because it's a little tall. Yeah, it didn't have to go in cargo, and and then brought it over here and. He can't hear. He can't hear. He's, and he's lost most of his teeth. 
So when when over there when she didn't have a name for him, she said she was sitting beside me. This is a true story. She was sitting beside some old man, and he, uh, most of the older men, well, have lost most of their teeth. But then we all have too. But then we have <laughs> fill-ins. But they don't have fill-ins. So she said, uh, "Well, what should we name him?" And he said, "Well." It, this is all Chinese. Well, we don't. He doesn't have any teeth, so we'll call him. Um, and the word for old is Lao, so call him Shao Lao, which is little old. So she calls him Shao Lao Lao, cause little old old, cause he doesn't have any teeth. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting story too, yeah. cause I understood your dog did come from China, but I yeah. wasn't sure all the background. Yeah. Thing. Priscilla, we all look around, we have so many modern conveniences and things that, <clears throat> is there something that you can say that, gee, I just could not live without that device? Let's see. I don't know. I suppose we could adapt ourselves to go without air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Hair dryer. <laughs> <laughs> I think I could probably adapt to almost anything. And we have when you travel abroad. Well, of course, yeah. when I went to China, it was over 20 years ago, and, and, and things were really different then. Japan wasn't so different, but China was really backwards. You had to, in the morning, you had to go down, you had to go to the boiler room where they kept the boiled water and take your little jug and fill it up with the boiled water and you just hoped that it boiled long enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so things have really changed there. I don't, I don't know, Damien. That's a, a good question. I'll say then as far as education, uh, and you had quite a few experiences in the different schools and all, what do you think has been some of the major changes in education and are they all for the better? You know, things have changed so much, and I've been gone out of the profession. I try to keep up. Um, I think what I hear from the teachers that are teaching now is that there's so much, they, they keep adding more and more and more things that you have to get through to your kids, and they start younger and younger, that it's really, a burden, and I know that this testing business is, is um, we always tested, um, and then they used to teach us not to, you're not supposed to teach to the test, you're just supposed to make sure that students get their, the information and that they've learned it, but now, the way the testing is, you have to test to the test, and I think that's, I think they just feel restricted. I don't think there's any room for creativity. A lot of the creativity in our schools has been taken out because of that. Priscilla, one thing I noticed that you did not really mention, but you've always had a involvement with music, and you didn't say anything about your choruses that you've had oh, yeah. and your church work of yeah, music. Yeah. Um, when my mother lived here, she started Forever Young Chorus. Do you remember that? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And then uh, she died maybe three years into it, and I took it over and had it for about seven years. And we traveled to nursing homes and places. And You know, it's, it, what happens in any organization is, after it's established, new people don't like to come in. Have you noticed that? Yes. Yeah, and that happens in your church choirs, and that happens, and it happened in this, and it happened in in, in um, um, women of no too. Same thing. So um, the, the people, you know, got older, and uh, of course Gertrude Stapp. Do you remember Gertrude mm -hmm. and her wonderful piano playing? And she got so she couldn't do it anymore. So we disbanded it we, and um, I had that for 10 years and there they 
I remember one time we'd meet, you know, and then travel to wherever we were going. And one time, I guess I wasn't there on time. They all left without me. And they went to Casey, and I had no idea which well, nursing were. home. <laughs> but I kind of finally found them. But they were kind of funny. And they always would have breakfast. Once a month, they would have breakfast. And they all wanted... Um, Biscuits and gravy, and none of them were supposed to eat it. <laughs> that was a big splurge. Yeah, they were a lot. I think they've all since died, but they were all nice people, and they had a, a good time. And Doit was kind of the live wire of that time, and um, that was nice. Yes, and then I had church choirs for about 35 years. And then I decided enough was enough. <laughs> and uh, then um, I had children's choirs as well. So, and then uh, when I retired, I'd always wanted to have, be part of a uh, woman singing I just thought that would be fun. So a bunch of Patty McCammon and, uh, and uh, Mary Lou Cornelson. That I'm, I'm thinking about the ones that the, the um, genesis of the group um, that started it, um, and Ann Bennett, and uh, we thought, well, we might as well go for it. So we did, and we did ten years. But the same thing happened there. You know, it got so new people. And then I would hear from people, well, so-and-so said she'd come and join us, but she didn't want to sing with so-and-so. And <laughs> what I find, too, though, is people in this, maybe it's a new generation, they don't want to make a commitment. If That's they can true. do it at their own choice, fine, but if there's a regular schedule, a practice, they don't want to be part of it. Yeah, that's true, and that happens in church, mm -hmm. and that happens in every place. Uh, every place, place. yeah. I'm, but... I thought it was probably time anyway, you know, 10 years, that's that's a good run. That's a good run. Yeah. Well, Priscilla, it's been a delight visiting with you. I enjoyed hearing your background and what brought you to Marshall. And I think this will be on file that the people will enjoy listening to you. <laughs> Rambling on. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate that so much. And uh, uh, with that, we will call it quits and we'll go on to another interview. Okay.